Today we're going to continue in our series, our fall series, asking the question, is this the end? We've got two messages down, and I want to we encourage you, if you've missed the first two messages, today may feel a little out of sorts, but uh, don't feel that too bad. We're going to kind of help get you uh, up to speed. But I want to encourage you, go back and listen to these messages and uh, get up to speed. The first message, we tackled the first 13 verses in Mark chapter 13. And really, it took a a look from the past, from Jesus' day, all the way to the present day, to today. And we noticed that when when you're asking the question, is this the end, that the answer is yes, we are living in the end times. How would you know? Well, there will be wars and famines and deception and distress and destruction and birth pains, and we talked about that. And, and also we have to recognize is that there will be people coming to the Lord uh, in record amounts, and we're seeing that across the globe. We believe that we are in the end times. Last week, we talked about, uh, really, between verse 13 and 14, we paused, and we didn't continue in Mark 13, and we looked at the white space at an event that Scripture talks about. Mark does not address it in the passage here, but we talked about the rapture. And I hope you had a little rapture practice this last week at some level and uh, pretended to, to be raptured and left your uh, family behind. And uh, hopefully, uh, seriously, I hope that there was some conversation at your work and in your uh, homes and with your families. And I just believe that as we talk about these things, it brings hope. It's not fearful. But you say, what's the rapture? Well, the rapture is the, a global church-wide event. It's the gathering of of the saints, where Jesus will come for the dead and the living, and the the rapture is also described as the blessed hope. I didn't mention that last week, but as I was kind of re- reversing or re- rehearsing uh, for this morning, not rehearsing, but kind of whatever. Uh, anyway, uh, the blessed hope, and within the assemblies of God, in their theology, uh, they call the rapture the blessed hope. And again, it's a catching away. It's a being snatched up in the twinkling of an eye. And you say, well, when is that going to happen, right? When will the return of Jesus happen? Well, the Bible says, when things are business as usual, when there's wars, rumors of war, but things are normal, where then you can look for the return of Christ. And I believe we are closer than any other generation. We are closer than ever. There's nothing holding back Jesus. And again, it's not this scary like, oh no, the Lord's going to return. It's more of a hope. That's why we say it's the blessed hope. It's, it's the hope of our salvation that Jesus is going to return for his church. Now, today we're going to get back into uh, Uh, into the Gospel of Mark. And uh, let's just uh, open up our our copies of God's Word. Uh, We've provided these for you. I think we have a few extra in the back if you're walking with us. And in uh, Mark chapter 13, there's a what we do with these is there's a spot for you to take notes, and today in particular, there's going to be a lot of Scripture. I'm going to encourage you to write down the Scripture so you can go back and forth and uh, to continue to study. I believe that this will become a resource for you uh, to, to really follow. Uh, when we get to Mark chapter uh, 13, it's the last week of Jesus' earthly ministry, so he's headed to the cross at the end of the week. They're leaving the temple, right, him and his disciples, and his disciples are commenting on how beautiful the temple is, and then Jesus says, look, there's not going to be even one of these stones that will be left uh, standing. In fact, in Matthew chapter 24, verses 1 through 3, it's the parallel passage to what happens in Mark chapter 13. It says, Jesus left the temple and was going away when his disciples came to point out to him the buildings of the temple. So they're admiring what what people had, had built. He answered them, you see all these, do you not? Truly I say, there will not be left here one stone upon that will not be thrown down. It's going to be total destruction of the temple. By the way, that happened in 70 AD, uh, about 66 years after Jesus uh, 
No, that's not right. Uh, but uh, 70 AD, it, I believe, was true. We talked about it a couple weeks ago. And then it goes on in verse 3. It says, And he sat at the Mount of Olives, and the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, and th these are the three questions that we're answering. He said, When will these things be? And what will the sign be of your coming? So they knew, even at an uh, understanding that Jesus was going to go away, that he's going to come back, right? What will the sign be? And of the end of the age. So kind of when is the end of the age? Three questions. They're asking, when will that happen? And that's where we'll pick up in Mark chapter 13, verse 14. And this is what it says. Follow along with me. It says, but when you see... The abomination of desolation standing where he ought not to be, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who is on the housetop not go down, not, nor enter his house to take anything out. And let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. And alas, for women who are pregnant and those days who are nursing mothers in those days, pray that it may not happen in the winter. It's interesting that Jesus does not know when the day or the hour will be, when the rapture will happen, and then we'll be ushered into the great tribulation, which we're going to talk about. Uh, it says, let the reader understand. This is very unusual language for Scripture, only seen a couple times. There's a shift in the mood in, the, in Mark chapter 13 here. And he's talking about, this whole section is the abomination of desolation. It, most commentators believe that what's this being described here is a seven-year period of time called the tribulation. Seven years, a time of calamity, a time of unparalleled demonic activity where the world will be shaken and everything will be turned upside down. And next week, if you like the idea of talking about the tribulation, next Sunday we're going to take a whole Sunday talking about the tribulation. And you say, well, what starts the tribulation? Well, the rapture of the church, which we talked about last week. And when that happens, the rapture of the church, we also see in Scripture that at the same time there will be the coming of a world ruler, a world dictator, and after three and a half years, that world dictator will uh, break covenant and invade the temple, set up his own image, and force the world to worship Satan. But let's not get ahead of ourselves too much. In verse 14, it says about the abomination of desolation, and then it says, where he ought not to be. Again, in the parallel passage in Mar uh, Matthew tw chapter 24, look what it says, verse 15. So when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel, which we're going to look at that in just a second, it says, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. Now, where he ought to be, what is this saying? I believe that this is saying that the abomination of desolation is describing a person, a person who is sacrilegious, is blasphemous, which we'll see. And I would question and say, is this describing the Antichrist? The language from Daniel when it talks about the abomination of desolation I believe it points to the world ruler, the Antichrist, who will emerge after the rapture. Now, track with me here. And this is where I want to encourage you to write down some scriptures and so you can go back and study these things for yourself. Let's look at first Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. It says this, And he shall make a strong covenant with many for one week, and for half of the week he shall put an end to sacrifice and suffering. So that's the first half of the tribulation where there will be uh, a kind of a world peace, and we'll talk about that in a second. And on the wing of abominations shall come one who makes desolate until the decreed end is poured out on the desolator. And again, this is tricky language, but it's describing a person, describing the abomination of desolation. Daniel chapter 12, verse 11 says, And from the time that the regular burnt offering is taken away and the abomination is 
uh, that makes desolate is set up, there will be 1,290 days. Do the math. That's three and a half years. We're going to see that later in Revelation, and we'll see the tithe. Another place where the abomination of desolation is talked about in Daniel, Daniel chapter 11, verse 31. It says, forces from him shall appear and profane the temple and fortress and shall take away the regular burnt offering and they shall set up the abomination that makes desolate. Again, a person is being described, a being, a king of sorts. The abomination of desolation, the Antichrist. You say, well, what does the Bible say about the Antichrist? And this is... I'll just say, uh, I've never studied about the Antichrist um, as deep as I've gone in the last couple weeks preparing for today's message. It's interesting that the word Antichrist, or uh, describing a person, is only seen four times in Scripture. But in the book of Revelation, there's a description of something they call the beast that most commentators believe is the Antichrist. And that's seen 35 times. And then in Daniel, what we just read, they talk about a king that rises to power and it uses king language. And then in the New Testament, a little later we're going to see, uh, the, I believe the Antichrist is described as a man of lawlessness. And so again, there's lots of different names here describing a person who will originally stop wars will absolve religious tensions, will relax the borders all over the world. There will be worldwide global economic prosperity. You say, well, who would that be? Who is it? Or when will that happen? In 1 John chapter 2, verse 18, Satan always continually has someone in the wings that can emerge into that role once the rapture happens because Satan doesn't know when Jesus will return for his people. Look what it says. It says, Dear children, this is 1 John chapter 2, verse 18. It says, Dear children, in the last hour, and as you have heard that the Antichrist, that's the Antichrist, is coming, even now many Antichrists have come. This is how we know it is the last hour. The idea here is that there's in the wings that Satan is always prepared to have someone arise to power. Another verse, Revelation chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, says this, Now I watch when the Lamb opened one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures say with the voice uh, uh, like thunder, Come. So that's, that's the rapture where Jesus is coming back for the church. And then I looked, and behold... A white horse and its rider had a bow and a crown was given to him. And he came out conquering and to conquer. Again, describing the emergence of this world superpower leader, the Antichrist. And again, it starts when the tribulation starts. A ruler who will come as a deliverer, who will be full of wisdom, a worldly wisdom that is, who will be powerful and charismatic in word and in deed. He will be all things to all men. He will be all things to all men. And what can we know about him? When you take a deep dive into Scripture, there's quite a bit that we can explore. In fact, there, uh, I would encourage you, if you're, you're hungry for this type of teaching or this kind of in, uh, these types of things, you can go deep, deep into this. I mean, there are 50-plus uh, you know, verses in Scripture that talk about the Antichrist in different forms. And I started to, to look, and I originally had 15 that I wanted to pull out and kind of make 15 points about the Antichrist. And I was thinking, man, that's probably too much. And then I honed it down, and I really seven out of the 15 really resonated with me uh, that I felt like we were, uh, that we could get our mind around. And that's what I'd like to do over these next few moments. Again, I want to encourage you to write these verses down. And after we look at the verse, look at Scripture first. That's where our hope comes from. That's what brings us back to Jesus, right? Uh, then I've got a few, uh, seven kind of uh, description of, uh, of the Antichrist. I want to encourage you to take some notes if this interests you. The first is to look at Daniel chapter 7. 
In verse 21, it says this, as I looked, this horn, that's describing the Antichrist, believe it or not, when you kind of study it, this horn made war with the saints and prevailed over them. A little later, it says in verse 25, he shall speak words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High and shall think to change the times and the law, which is very interesting. We're not going to talk about that. And they shall be given into his hands for a time, times, and half a time. That's describing three and a half years. The first takeaway or the first thing to describe the Antichrist is that the Antichrist will persecute Christians. And we'll talk about that. Christians. I thought they were raptured, and we'll, we'll look at that in a minute. But it says that they, they, he'll make war against the saints. He'll speak words against the Most High. He will wear out the saints. The Antichrist will hate Christians. The next verse is Daniel chapter 8. In verse 23, it says, At the latter end of their kingdom, when the transgressors have reached their limit, a king, this is describing the Antichrist, of bold face, one who understands riddles, shall arise. His power will be great, not by his own power. The second takeaway, or the second thing to describe the Antichrist is that the Antichrist will be a medium. Not a large or an extra large, medium. No, 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 a medium. In other words, he'll be a spiritus. He will be a part of the occult. He will be able to do supernatural things that will blow people's minds. He will be under the influence of Satan. The Antichrist will persecute Christians. He'll be a medium. The third verse we'll look at is Daniel eleven thirty six. Again, describing the Antichrist as a king, it says, And the king shall do as he wills. He shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god. So he'll be blasphemous. And he shall uh, astonish or speak astonishing things against the God of gods. He shall prosper till the indignation is accomplished, for what is decreed shall be done. In other words, he will be a dictator and uh, he will consider himself to be a god, and he will be a blasphemer. Look at at that. The Antichrist, he will be a dictator, a ruler with an iron fist. He will consider himself a god and will be a blasphemer. These are things that we can learn through Scripture. The next verse is Daniel chapter 11, verse 38. And I know there's uh, several verses here. I want to encourage you to be tracking with me. It says, he shall honor the god of fortresses instead of these. The idea there is that the Antichrist will worship military might. So he will be a political power, but he will use force. He will, be, uh, he will uh, bring armies. He will gather an army. It will be a political war first, but then it will be an actual war where people will uh, you know, live and die by the sword. And it will not be in the tribulation within those seven years. It will not be a, a very fun time to live. In fact, uh, two-thirds of the population of the world, uh, some commentators estimate, will be destroyed. That is crazy. The Antichrist will worship military might. That was number four. The fifth verse it comes from Second, uh, Second Thessalonians. Now we're moving into the New Testament. In first, or Second Thessalonians chapter two, verses three, we'll start there. It says, "Let no one deceive you in many ways, uh, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first and the man of lawlessness." You can underline that or look at that, or write it in the margin. The man of law- lawlessness is describing the Antichrist is revealed, the son of destruction who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God and object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. In verse 9, a little later in that same chapter, it says, And the coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan with all power and false signs and wonders. This is crazy. The Antichrist will claim deity 
and will be able to do miracles. Remember, he's a medium. He's, he has a spiritist. He will be able to tap into satanic powers. He will be doing miracles, and people will turn to him because of that. A couple more verses. Revelation chapter 13. So now we're at the very end of the Scripture. Verse 3 says this, one of its heads, this is talking about the beast, right, seemed to have a mortal wound, but its mortal wound was healed, and the whole earth marveled as they followed the beast. That's the Antichrist. Verse 12, this is talking about a false prophet. It, it says, it exercises all authority of the first beast in its presence and makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast who was uh, the Antichrist, whose mortal wound would be healed. This is interesting. The Antichrist apparently will be assassinated and then be resurrected. The Antichrist. It will be a type of Christ, but anti against Christ. And one last verse, and then we'll, then we'll continue. Revelation 13, verse 4. And it says, And they worship the dragon, that's Satan. For he had given his authority to the beast, that's the Antichrist. And they worshiped the beast, listen to this, saying, Who is like the beast, and who can fight against it? The seventh description of the Antichrist that resonated with me, is that the Antichrist will demand worship. He will demand to be worshipped. And then, of course, that goes right against what uh, Ezekiel, or, uh, um, Exodus 15, 11 and Psalm 35, 10 say, where we should keep God, uh, He's the only one we should worship. Who is like our Lord? He's the only one that really deserves worship. Now let's go back to Matthew chapter 13, our text for the day. So we've looked at some kind of descriptions of the Antichrist. It says, but when you see the abomination of desolation standing where he, that's the Antichrist, ought not to be, let the reader understand. And let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let no one, or let the one who is on the housetop not go down, nor enter this house, or to take anything out. And let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak, kind of like Lot did with his wife, right? Don't turn back, in other words. And alas, for the women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days, pray that it may not happen in winter. What do you do? This is the question I want to pose. What do you do if you miss the rapture, the rapture of the church? And the answer, according to Mark chapter 13, is you run. You get out of Dodge. The Antichrist emerges, and you don't stick around. And this, is, this will not be an easy time, according to Scripture, to say the least. Every previous woe that you have had or ever experienced, when you look at wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes and famines and fires and, and you look at the destruction across the globe, none of that will compare. And We're going to talk about the tribulation next week. And he even says if you're pregnant or, nurse, or nursing or if it's in the, if it's in the winter, it, it, the idea here is it will not be easy. And plus, what we see here is that there's a shift theologically. When you study Scripture, the Bible in its, in its entirety, in almost every case, when there's persecution, the church grows. And the church, God's people, are called to stand firm in the persecution. But there's a change here. In this persecution, instead of standing firm, instead of being bold, now what we see is that the Great Commission to go into all the earth and preach the gospel is no longer in effect. There's no obligation to evangelize when the tribulation comes. And because of that, you don't stay and be patient. You get out. You run. You say, well, why not just give up? Why not just, you know, throw in the towel, right? Well, Mark 13, verses 19 and 20, look what it says. It says, in those days there was such tribulation that has not been 
from the beginning of the creation that God created until now and never will be. In verse 20 says, And if the Lord had not cut the days short, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect whom he, choo- he chose, he shortened the days. And so we know it's just a seven-year period of time, three and a half years at, towards the end of destruction, and it will be that way. And it, but it says there, no human being would be saved, uh, but the sake for the sake of the elect. You're saying, are there true believers? Will there be Christians in the time of the tribulation? And I believe that there will be. What do you do if you miss the rapture? That's kind of the question that I, I believe is kind of set up here. What do you do? You find Jesus. You surrender your heart. And then you run. In Revelation chapter 13, starting in verse 5, it says, And the beast, that's the Antichrist, was given a mouth uttering ha- uh, haughty and blasphemous words. And it was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months. That's three and a half years. It opened its mouth to utter blasphemes against God, blaspheming His name and His dwelling, that is, those who dwell in heaven. Also, it was allowed to make war against the saints and to conquer them. So in other words, the, the rapture has happened, the saints are taken up to be, ha- to be in heaven, but there will be those that will have heard messages like this, or that have heard uh, friends and family tell them about Jesus, that the rapture is going to happen, and they turn to the Bible, and they find out the good news, they surrender their hearts to Jesus, the saints will be there, but it says that the Antichrist will make war on the saints to conquer them. The authority was given to every other tribe and people and language and nation, and all who dwell on the earth will worship it, right? Everyone whose name has not been written in the foundation of the world in the book of life uh, of the Lamb will, who, who was slain. If anyone has ear, let him hear. And then look what it says. It says, if anyone is to be taken captive, to captivity he goes. So in other words, saints... If if you give your heart to the Lord after the rapture, if you are taken into captivity, that's that's just what's going to happen. If anyone is to be slain by the sword, with the sword he must be slain. There will be Christians that will be martyred in the tribulation. And then it says, here is the call for the endurance of the faith, or the endurance and faith of the saints. And so if you don't make it and you turn your heart to the Lord after the rapture, the Antichrist is ruling and reigning. According to Mark, you run, you get out of there, and it's going to take some endurance. It's going to take some great faith to be able to make it through. In Revelation 14, this is our our last verse Verses 9 through 12, it says, And another angel, a third, followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast, that's the Antichrist, and its image, and receives the mark on his forehead or on his hand, he will also drink the wine of God's wrath, poured full strength into the cup of his anger, and he will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. This is talking about the mark of the beast. And the smoke of the torment goes up forever and ever, and they will have no rest day or night. These worshipers of the beast and his image, and whoever receives this mark of its name. And of course, uh, you've probably heard, if you haven't heard, you don't want to take the mark of the beast. Now, this is not going to be something uh, that just happens by accident or is slipped in when you go to the hospital and you're unconscious and all of a sudden someone slips in uh, a chip. This will be a conscious decision that you will be able to make in the end times. Look at what it says, though, in verse 12. It says, here is the call for the endurance of the saints. So in other words, if you're in the end times, or if you're in the tribulation, you weren't raptured, but you gave your heart to Jesus after the fact, it says there's an endurance that will be needed for those who keep the commands of God and their faith in Jesus. 
There's a book I've been reading. It's called Hope in the Last Days, and I can't believe it. I forgot it um, on my stack of books at home. I called Logan, who was our drummer this morning, and, and he was already on his way here, and so uh, he wasn't able to snag it. But uh, within that, uh, it's a book by Dave Williams, and, and uh, it's a great book. In fact, Ariane, you gave it to me to, to read. Uh, he talks about what to do if you don't make the rapture. And he lists like 20 different things. And I was going to just read a few of those. And so these are from memory, uh, some things that I remembered from my study. I just wrote these in this morning. I was going to read them out of the book, but, uh, but I forgot the book. But it says, uh, to uh, for, certainly don't take the, the mark of the beast. And again, there, he talks about there will be, uh, it'll be a conscious decision. You, you won't be tricked into it. it it'll be something that will be very clear. Uh, in fact, you go back in the days, and he talks, it, it's funny, uh, when Social Security uh, was first invented, there, uh, people thought that that was the mark of the beast, right? Now you have a number. And, and, uh, and now uh, many of you are very happy for Social Security and drawing on benefits, and uh, that's just the case, you know, that, that's what happened. But um, then when credit cards came out, saying, oh, man, that could be the mark of the beast. Listen, it will be something super clear. It will be happen in the, in the tribulation. And really, as if you're a Christ follower on this, uh, this side of the rapture, I don't believe it's something we have to worry about. Again, Dave Williams, though, he says, get out, get away. He says, don't come to a local church because uh, uh, there will be persecution there. Uh, he says, don't listen to the way that uh, the social media twists what's happening and because uh, the uh, world rulers after the church is ejected and raptured certainly will uh, twist things and you think that, uh, that the news today is corrupt, it will certainly be corrupt in the last days uh, in, that, in that time. And then what else did I write here? Um, yeah, uh, there, was, there were several others. Uh, but anyway, the idea is uh, you don't want to miss it, okay? So let, let's, but, but for those that would, those that don't make it in the rapture, you need to know these things. You need to know that there will be an Antichrist that will come to power. And I know it's a crazy message, and I understand that we're talking about end-time things, eschatology, right? And last week we said we're not going to fight about these things. There are certainly different views, uh, and we, can, we don't break fellowship over uh, non-essential doctrines, but we can look to Scripture, and when we look at Scripture and try to understand and we ask the Holy Spirit to help us, we can know some things, and we've said that along the way. And the key is Scripture, and when we study Scripture... It's not something to fear. It actually brings great hope. And what I want you to see throughout this whole series, asking the question, is this the end, is that there is hope. The enemy would love to attack our hope. But in the end times, we can hang on to Scripture, knowing that God is in control, knowing that, yes, we are living in the end days, the end is near. Jesus is coming. What's next? According to Scripture, the next big thing for the church worldwide is the rapture of the saints, dead and living. When will that happen? No one knows the day or the hour. And the fact of the matter is, is we have to answer the question, are we ready to meet Jesus? Are you ready if Jesus comes for his church? We've landed on this thought for the last two weeks. And as I considered how to end this service again, my heart comes back to this question. Will you be ready? In fact, this may be the most important moment in your life. This could be the most important message uh, that you've ever heard. Luke chapter 12 verse 40 says, you also must be ready for the Son of Man is coming in an hour that you, that when you will not expect it. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verses 1 and 2 says, now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you, for you are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. The truth is that Jesus is coming back, and we don't know when. 
And the question is, are you ready if Jesus was to return? He could return today. In fact, when we study Mark chapter 13, within Mark chapter 13, there are eight times in Mark 13 that are warnings saying, be on guard, stay away, stay alert, stay ready, be watching. It's a call to those that don't know Jesus. And if you're here this morning or you're watching online and you don't know the Lord as your personal Savior, today can be your day where you surrender and give your heart to Jesus. That's the first big takeaway. The second takeaway is for the saints, for those that believe in Jesus today. And the question is, is who are you telling about Jesus? This last week, I heard a story of one of our people in the congregation. They, uh, last week, they were challenged with that same question, who are you going to tell about Jesus? And they contacted me on Thursday asking me to pray. And they said, today's the day I'm, uh, I'm going to work, and there's a guy that I've had a little conversation before, but I'm going for it today and ask for some prayer. And that's the idea. The idea is that every single week from this point till Jesus returns or we're taken by the grave, we, as God's people, should be asking ourselves, who should we be telling? Because if you don't, there will be people that will be missing and will be not raptured, that will live through the tribulation, may or may not give their heart to the Lord in the tribulation and be maybe lost for eternity. But today, we have an opportunity. The Great Commission is in effect that says to go into all the world, to preach the gospel, to share the good news, to tell others about Jesus. And I just want to take a little survey and I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands, but I want you to ask yourself, if you've been here over the last couple weeks, and I know we've got some first-timers, this obviously would not, uh, would not uh, apply. But if you've been sitting in these services, talking about the end times, asking the question, is this the end? Who have you told about Jesus in the last couple weeks? Who have you intentionally ran into or maybe God put in your path and you shared the gospel message to an unbeliever. My hope and prayer is that you can point to somebody. And if you can't point to somebody saying, yes, I've had the conversation or my neighbor or we talked about it or, or whatever the case might be, I'm going to ask again until it sinks in. Who? are you going to tell this week about Jesus? Because when we open up our mouth and we share the good news, we don't have to worry about what to say in that time or that moment. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit will speak through us. And it's not us that does the work. It's the Holy Spirit at work. And I believe the only reason we would even consider talking about the end times is so that we, as a God's people, would be able to reach one more. That's got to be the passion. I'm going to ask that you stand right where you are, everyone, across the uh, congregation here. If you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus as your personal Savior, if you don't know the Lord, I want to offer you the free gift of salvation. If you are not ready to meet Jesus, if you were to return today, or if you were to be taken by the grave, uh, and tragically in some way uh, in an accident or something like that, if you don't know Jesus, I'm going to pray a quick prayer. It's not the prayer that saves you. It's the believing in your heart that Jesus is Lord. And I just want to encourage you that this prayer can be your prayer. So let's pray. Lord Jesus, I'm sorry for the things I've done wrong. I'm sorry for the sin in my life. And I understand that sin is not allowed in heaven. But there's Jesus who died on the cross for me. And today I put my faith in Jesus. I put my faith in your son, Jesus. And Lord, I'm asking that you would clean up my heart. Make it white as snow. And Lord, that you would just give me the 
joy of salvation. Just a peace in my heart that I don't have to worry about what could be coming or what is coming. But there's a confidence in you. And Jesus, I just surrender to you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Real quick, if you prayed that prayer today and you are making yourself, or you're saying, man, that, that, that was my prayer. Whether you're online or you're here in the congregation, uh, in, the, in person, I want to encourage you to make yourself known. And what that means is that you tell someone about your decision to follow Christ. You make yourself known. And we have tools and ways to follow up with you that are going to be an encouragement to you. I want to encourage you to take advantage of those things. And again, if you don't, uh, if you already know the Lord, and uh, many of us do, I want, to, I want us to leave on this thought. Who are you going to share the gospel with this week? And Lord, as we contemplate that in this moment, I pray that it would burn in our hearts. And Lord, I pray that you would go before us, behind us, and all around us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen and amen. God bless you. I'm going to encourage you to go ahead and put your masks on, and then the ushers will dismiss you from the back to the front. God bless you. Go in the grace of God. We love you. Thanks for being here today.